How's everybody doing today? Good. Not bad. I'm excited about this message. Someone asked me, um, what's your preaching style? And, and I thought, you know, for a couple minutes, I said, well, you know, for the, for the first 15 plus years of, of my ministry, 90, 95% of my teaching, preaching, teaching, you know, was aimed at middle school students, high school students, college students. Um, some, sometimes I would need to, to talk or speak two or three times a week. I would do an outreach in the, in the middle of the week with kids and then a Sunday school program and then a leadership um, ministry. So I'd have to prepare sometimes multiple talks throughout the week. I was always looking for material, for stories, for, for illustrations to keep this sort of mainly younger crowd engaged. I mentioned in a sermon a, a while back that I love stories. I actually studied you know, storytelling. I, I love good stories. Um, I, I don't think I've even said this in a sermon before, but I actually went to an improv and comedy, sort of stand-up comedy workshop once because I just thought it would, you know, help me in this situation. You know, I, I, I believe I was the only pastor in, in the group, you know. One of, one of the workshops or one of the assignments we had was tell a dirty joke. I, I I wasn't real strong at that one. I, I, you know, I, I came up short there. But I felt like, you know, speaking often in front of 500 or so teenagers, I could use a little humor to keep them engaged. Because often they would tune out right at, how's everybody doing today? Boom, they were out, right? My teaching style. On any given week, I don't know if you're aware of this, I might listen to 10 or, or a more podcast of sermons from sort of national preachers, some of the larger churches across the country. Also listen to some really little, lesser-known men and women. And I'll listen to them um, each week, multiple times. Some of you might know Dr. Jim Platt on our, on our team here. Jo Dr. Jim, he's, he's a professor at Duquesne University, also at Pittsburgh Seminary. And after a lot of prayer, and I sort of land on a text that I'm going to use, I tell Jim that text, and he goes and finds me five or six of the best commentaries on that particular test, runs copies of them, puts them on my desk. I sort of plow through those. So when pulling a sermon together, I'm often pulling together from all of that, plus life experiences, plus my early morning sort of quiet prayer time. I'm, I'm pretty committed to this 615 slot where I'm up and I'm in the Word and I'm saying, God, what do you, what do you got for me? And then ultimately, somewhere by the end of the week, my assistant is, is, is guarding the door to my office because she knows i got to get this done. And it's not necessarily to keep people out. It's typically to keep me from escaping and wandering off. Um, so I don't know if I have a teaching style, but I, I'd like to think a couple things. Um, I like to think I don't pull any punches. Um, I like to think I can hit you know, you pretty hard with a topic, particularly if I'm passionate about it, but leave you encouraged, you know, maybe laughing a little bit. Sometimes I think that comes from the preachers that, that I love to listen to and, and emulate. And I think some of that might just come from sort of my, you know, steel um, background, a mill town, you know, sort of growing up in a, in a you know, in that kind of environment. Um, so with all that said, and, and the reason why I say that, is when I do a sermon that's filled with, you know, some humor maybe or a topic that you want to hear about, typically I get some encouraging feedback. You know, it's like, hey, Scott, man, thank you for that. I, I, I needed to hear that. Or, you know, that was funny. It was, you know, it was, it was really great listening to you. Today's topic, for many of us, is not one of those topics. You will most likely not be excited about today's topic of the message. Today I want to talk to you about money. And at this time I've instructed the ushers to bolt and lock the doors. A couple things. One, intentionally, um, at all of our campuses, at all services, we took our offering before the message. Because I don't want you to feel guilted into giving something out of the ordinary today so that you can feel good leaving today, but then completely dismiss everything I have to say. 
Also, I want you to know, three months into our fiscal sort of budget cycle at Northway, the fiscal season starts in July, um, so we're three or so months into that. We are in a good place financially. So I'm not going to, you know, announce at the end of this message some kind of project or campaign or something I want you to give to. This is not about Northway. Hear me on this. It's about you. And my hope would be simply this. I want all of us to just evaluate our thoughts on giving. And I want to be clear what I mean by giving. I mean giving money. This is not a message on time, talent, and treasure. This is a message on treasure, right? I, I want to make sure that I think too often, you know, sometimes, and I think I do this sometimes, you know, I'll group those all three together. And, and, I, and you can leave and say, well, you know, I'm just Jim Dandy at giving my time and my talent. It's that treasure thing that's a little bugger for me. I don't even know anybody that talks like that, but that's. <laughs> so are you excited about this? Huh? Anybody bring a friend for the first time today? You're like, Stephen, seriously? I've been trying to get this guy to come forever, and you said Jim Dandy, and you're going to talk about tithing, right? So before we dig into this, let me clear on a couple things. One, if you're unemployed, this doesn't apply to you. So please know, know that in that situation that you're in, let the church help you. I don't even know if you're aware of this. We have a Samaritan's Fund here that helps church members with that are out of work or in crisis with utility bills. We have a food bank here. In fact, if you have some extra income right now, those would be great places to just designate some money to. We set that aside for folks in, that situ in those situations. Secondly, this before I dig in. I need you to hear this from me. Personally, this took me a long time to get, to embrace giving to understand tithing. But please hear me on this. I consider that one of my biggest spiritual regrets. I sure wish I would have gotten this sooner. So I'm going to be hard in some spots, and, and, and not because Northway needs you to get this, but because I really believe your heart needs to get this. So, so I want to start with an illustration. If you're a believer, then somewhere in your point you made a decision to follow Jesus, and therefore um, your eternal destination is secured. You know where you're going when you die. So if this rope here were to represent your life, okay? So there it is. That's your life from here all the way out. This blue part of the rope right here, if you can see that, represents your time here on earth. The rest of it, all the way out, represents eternity. It's this undescribable time where with God, with believers from the past and those yet to come, in this unbelievable place of joy, of peace. But this represents our life here on earth. Take a look at that. Right? Oh, look, you know, there you are. You're born right there. Look how cute you are, huh? And there you are on your first day of school with your little backpack. Isn't that nice? Now you've grown up a little bit, and there's your first kiss, and that was awkward, right, huh? And here you go. Oh, you're off to college. You meet a gal. You get married. You have some kids, you get that big promotion at work right there. Oh, corner, office, new car, right? Way to go, right there. You have some more kids, life's going on well, and you get to about here, 25th wedding anniversary, right there, right there. And, and way to go. I mean, you picked up the diamond bracelet for her, you told her that you'd do it all over again. Well done, mister. Right here, your kids are now getting married. You're settling in to an empty nest time. You retire. 
from work and you get a, a gold watch. Isn't that dandy? I said dandy twice in the, in the same sermon. I think that's a record. Um, so, so now, oh, you're, you're aging gracefully right out here. Right out here. You're aging so gracefully. And look, right here. The Pirates won the World Series. So now you can die happy, right? So you die right there. Now, I know that you've heard this, be, this said before, right? But folks, you cannot take any stuff from this blue part with you there. The corner office, the new car, the diamond bracelet, wonderful things. But they're not coming with you there. You tracking with me on that? On this day, at the end of that blue spot on that timeline of life, I believe that one of our biggest regrets might be what we didn't give away to God. And on your notes, I, I call this Kingdom Economics 101, and I define it this way. What we give away, we get to keep forever. And what we keep, we leave behind forever. And I had a really hard time getting that. I'll just be honest with you. And maybe this illustration will help you. I read this somewhere years ago. When I get to do my taxes at the end of the year, I can get pretty upset when I look at the, the income side. Not because of the amount that I make, because I'm okay with that, but what I can do in my head is some pretty quick math, and I can almost say, well, a third of that I can say goodbye to, right? That's going to be in taxes due. It was good making all that money all year long, but during tax time at the end of the season, I say, oh, man, I wish I could have kept more of that. I didn't keep as much of that as I would have cared to. But see, you know what energizes me at the end of the year during that tax time? When I see the amount of money that I gave to the church. When I see a, re, uh, a receipt from a mission trip that I supported. When, when I see a statement from, from a, a check receipt from a, a charitable organization that I gave to. When the statement comes in, the year-end summary of the child that we are sponsoring. And now throughout the year, though, sometimes it's difficult in those, for those things, right? Because you say, so I'd really like to give this check to the orphanage in Haiti. But man, I could, I could use an, an upgrade on that iPhone, and I'd really like to do that. But, but see, at the end of the year, when I total up all those statements and giving receipts, it represents a little less that I have to lose and a little more than I get to keep. See, and I suspect that that's what it's going to be like on Judgment Day. What I have given away is going to represent what I get to keep with me. And what I've held on to is going to be gone. You know, the iPhone 5, it's, it's, it's really cool. I'd, I'd love to have an upgrade on that thing right now over here in the blue part of the tape. But kids in Haiti that through my giving maybe get fed that day, get, get rescued uh, off of the streets, come to know Christ, are going to be with me in eternity. What's the balance on that? L listen, you got to hear me say this right away. There is nothing wrong with having great stuff. So that is not what I'm talking about at all. But here's my question to you. Is your stuff your treasure or is Jesus your treasure? And I know that so many of you say, that's easy, Scott. Jesus, come on. Well, here's a test for you then if you really want to know that for sure in your heart. Take your bank statement and your schedule and lay them down side by side and look at them. And you will be able to see where your treasure is, where your heart is, where your priorities are. I think it's sort of ironic that, that on the dollar bill, right, it says, in God we trust. 
Yet I believe that when it comes to money, it's one of the most difficult things we struggle with really trusting God. And that's why in this series, My Own Worst Enemy, you know, frankly, if we didn't talk about money, it would be incomplete. I have to tell you, if we didn't talk about money in a series called My Own Worst Enemy, the series would be a farce. It really would. So in Matthew 6, Jesus is speaking to his disciples about their hearts and about what they should consider important to them and what they should not. He has just got done in this chapter talking about giving to those in need. He's just got done explaining to them the Lord's Prayer and how to do it. And now he goes into this issue of money. And in verse 19 he says, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For, and here's the line, where your treasure is, there will be, there your heart will be also. You, you know, I don't believe he's talking to the disciples here about, you know, how to spend their shekels that day, that week, right? He's talking about eternity. He's talking about the kingdom economics that I mentioned earlier, what we give away, we get to keep forever. And what we hold on to, we leave behind forever. Somehow, what we give away is waiting in eternity for us as a blessing. And I'm not quite sure how that even works out or what it looks like. But that's what Jesus is talking about here. Because what we lay up, he says, and hold on to ourselves, it's going to fade. It's going to rust. Eventually, someone else is going to own it. If that's Kingdom Economics 101, then 201, and again, it took me a while to embrace this or maybe fully get it, is this. God does not need my money. It is already his. In Psalm 50, verse 10 says that. Psalm 50, verse 10. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field is mine. Listen to what God says here. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. For the world and its fullness are mine. We've got to get a hold of this. God owns it all, right? He owns it all. He is not sitting up in heaven somewhere fretting whether or not I'm going to write a check. He's not pacing around, you know, biting his fingernails, sitting on the edge of his big old throne, you know, saying, write a check. For goodness sake, Stevens, write the check. Now add a zero to it. Don't put your pen down. He's not doing that. He's concerned with my heart, and he knows that my money, if it's not one of the biggest, I think it's the biggest thing that prevents me from really letting him have everything in my life. Everything but that, God. I just need to hold on to that. You know, I want to talk a bit about tithing. Because this is a talk about money, and I'm a pastor, right? So, you know, I believe it's part of the oath when I was ordained. <laughs> Stop swearing, you know, look happy in public, get a sport coat, and talk about tithing, right? That's, that was it. That was on the list. And I'm not going to go into all the biblical sort of foundations for the 10% tithe to God. Um, it's there. And you'll have to trust me on that. And now some will say, well, Scott, that was way back in the Old Testament law. And Jesus came to abolish the law. Frankly, you got to know this, it was pre-law. It was Cain, it was back in Cain and Abel, it's in there. It's back in Abraham's time. It predates Moses and the law. And folks, God is the same now as he was then. Jesus came to fulfill the law, not erase it. Jesus came to move the 10% from an obligation issue to a heart issue. That is what he is saying to the disciples in Matthew 6. 
You know, I was in the East End last week at our campus down there for the worship service. And um, they had a, like a sort of small choir, and, and they sang the old hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore You. And a young gal named Lisa, um, who I've had the pleasure of, of watching sort of grow up in our Oakland campus over the past several years. She is truly like this amazing young lady. She led the song from the keyboards, and, and the choir was singing. And at one point, this guy stepped out of the choir, and he grabbed a microphone. And in one of the choruses, he took it to a rap. He rapped a chorus, put in his own words. And frankly, I got to tell you, the energy in the place, the spirit in the, in the room, the place like exploded. Everybody was like, oh my goodness. And I got a chance to, to talk to him after the service because I didn't know him. And it turns out he performs and, and he teaches rap and he goes by M-O-T, which, which stands for Minister of Truth. And he gave me a CD um, and I began listening to it. Um, throughout this week. And there's a song on it, first song on the track called, I Don't Walk Alone. And he's rapping about growing closer to God, how he wants to really get, he wants to expand his, his growth and his walk with Lord. He, he talks about in this song about being connected to the king. And there's a line in the song where he says this, no more baby steps, this ain't Gerber. I just love that. When I heard that in the song, I just said, that is, that's good stuff right there. Folks, on this issue of tithing, please hear me. It's a heart issue, not a percentage issue. If you are hung up on the 10%, that's baby steps, folks. That's baby food. We've been taught and we've been told that the first 10% belongs to God, right? Can I say something? No. That's Gerber. 100% belongs to God. He just tells us he's going to let us keep 90. That's a good deal. And until we come to grips with the internal perspective of that, we're going to continue, I think, to be childish at times in this area of our lives, of our spiritual life. Here is what I've discovered. When I realize that, that, that it's all his, anyhow, and that God does not need my money, and that when I give him 10%, I somehow manage to enjoy my 90% even more. And my, my, my 90% somehow becomes like a whole lot more than it was. And I don't even know how to describe that to you folks, but I see some of you nodding your head, so I know that you're tracking with me, because I don't get it. But I know when I do it, it just happens. And it's an amazing feeling. And I'd love you to grab a hold of that. I saw this video um, probably like over a year ago. And I looked at it again when I was preparing this um, sermon. And it sort of portrays some of the reasons we do not tithe in a, in a humorous way. But when I watch it this time, something stuck, something hit me. So, so take a look at this. Now, hey, loosen up, all right? Everybody loosen up. T take a look at this. See if maybe you see yourself in one of these characters. I give to God by enjoying what he has given me, okay? I mean, do you really think he expects something back? Now, I know there's a lot of people at church that would not understand this line of reasoning. That's why, just to make things simple and not to cause any controversy, I like to carry what I call the little empty envelope, all right? You see, when the plate gets passed, I bloop, put it in there like that. The deacon's counting the money. They only know me as the crazy empty envelope guy, but the people sitting around me, clueless. <laughs> I win, they win, God wins. No one gets hurt because no one knows. God knows. Huh? Let me ask you a question, huh? How's your mutual fund? Hey, for that matter, how's all your funds? Ha has the fun left your funds, huh? Has your dole me taken a W-A-L-K, huh? <laughs> what if I told you that I knew about an investment you could make that the return would be 
mind-boggling. And, and, and it, it's, it's promised, it's guaranteed. I know what you're saying, there's no guarantees. This one's guaranteed, okay? Malachi 3.10, that's what it says in the Old Testament. It says, test me, give to God, and he will give you back. It goes like this, I give this, he gives this. I give this, he gives this. I give this, up right up there. He keeps giving, I can't outgive God. How crazy is that? <laughs> Do I love him? Sure, whatever. I'm just saying, if you give, he gives back. <laughs> I tithe, but just not like in the form of a 10% check per se. Let me tell you what I mean. When I go to church on a Sunday morning, they're selling donuts, I buy some, boom, that's a tithe. When my whole Sunday school class wants donuts and I, out of the goodness of my heart, buy a whole bunch for the Sunday school class, boom, that's another tithe. But it's not about me spending money. It's about the smile on people's faces. That, my friends, is tithe enough for me. Case in point, the church was having date nights where we could take our spouse out for an evening, and they were charging $25 for child care. Boom shakalaka tithe. I'll tell you what the biggest tithe was. When I spent over $100 on our meal, and my wife was grinning ear to ear, that, my friend's a tithe. I, I would like to give. I would, okay? But everything right now is just Crazy, I mean, just crazy, you know? I mean, not normal crazy, really crazy, you know? And if after I paid my bills and took care of the things that I need and want, then I would, I would consider giving something, but not, now's crazy. We're, we're, we're gonna give later, we've already talked about it. I mean, down the road we'll be crazy givers, but right now it's just crazy. Yeah, I have money, that's a fact. But you know what, it's a heart thing between me and the Lord and the pastor because he needs to know what I'm giving now that we have this little building campaign going on, if you know what I'm saying. And pastor, I'd give a little bit more, I'd give a little something, something if you'd have that music minister sing a couple more hymns now and then, huh? Hey, what's this, watch this. Is that a Benjamin? I think it is. Benji likes hymns, come on. You want it? Ah, come on, pastor, do what I say, huh? Ah, 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 ah. <laughs> Benji likes hymns, right? <laughs> Funny. But you know what I saw when I watched this? I saw me. I mean, early in my Christian walk, I was clearly that non-giver guy. I wasn't putting empty envelopes in the basket, but I was just passing the basket. I figured that was for someone else, someone older, someone with more money. The, the clueless guy, I, I did this. You know, 25 years ago, when I, when I started in ministry, I was working at a church, and I, I felt like I was the underpaid sort of youth guy, right? And, you know, if kids were selling, like, candy bars or something to go on a retreat, I'd buy candy bars. Boom shakalaka tithe, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, and I might have been given a certain percentage to the church, two or, 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 or 3% or something, and... I was making up the rest in my mind just by gracing them with my participation. The manipulator guy, the, the Benji likes hymns guy, you know, believe it or not, I was this guy too. You know, I worked at a church many years ago that had a large trust fund. It had like over a million dollars in it. And I thought that they should be giving more to the community. They should be giving more to kids. They should be giving more to mission. And, and and when they didn't, or when I judged what maybe they were giving it to was foolish, Scotty, you know, he didn't necessarily want more hymns. But, but he thought what he wanted what was important, and therefore, you know, I just held back. You know, if you, if you look around Northway long enough and hard enough, you're going to find a reason probably to withhold giving. Heck, I'm the lead pastor, and I probably can, right? Is your issue, though, with Northway? Or if you're honest, is it with God? For, for me, I think God had to sort of grab a hold of me and beat a little bit of this know-it-all attitude out of me that I was carrying around and work on my heart. And I, got, I came to the grips that, that when you don't give, it doesn't hurt God. In this case, it wouldn't hurt Northway. It hurts you. It hurt me. It hurt my soul. And I'm telling you, I'm so glad that at some point many years ago, I got a hold of this. The excuse maker guy, right? We, we've, we've all been there. You know, maybe it's kids are in college or 
something's going on or maybe you spent something that, that you shouldn't have spent or something you need to do and you're like, I'll give, but I just, I've been crazy right now, right? You heard them. A couple things just practical for you um, if you're in this spot. One, at all of our campuses, several times a year at each campus, we do this financial peace class, the Financial Peace Institute. You got to take this. It's a 10-week study that really helps you manage your money. It gets you in systems and budgets, and it's biblically based. It is amazing. Sign in your notes right now. If you're one of that excuse maker, God, things are just crazy right now. Sign up. I want to know when the next one is and take that. The next thing, I just encourage you, if, you, if that's you, that excuse maker guy, um, Craig Rochelle at lifechurch.tv, and I put this right in your notes, right in there, the website. One of my favorite pastors, this guy is an incredible teacher. He just got done doing a four-part series at their church called Strapped. The sermons, video and podcast are on their website. They're each about 30 minutes long. There's four of them. Go and just watch one. And then watch another one a couple days later or next week. Watch one a week over the next week. It will help you. This guy is an amazing teacher. It's in your notes. Just go and look at it. I would encourage you. It will make a difference. And I just want to address the, the, the investment giver guy because that was sort of funny. But I just I felt like I couldn't go on without saying something here. There is a belief out there that God is like a vending machine to his children. You give him and out pops a new car. A beautiful wife, clever children, right? Happiness and prosperity is the aim of life. We exist so that God can bless us. Give, give a lot, give hard, and couple that, you know, with faithful living. And God will provide beyond your riches, beyond your wildest dreams. Folks, giving is important. It's a must but it does not assure you health and wealth. Giving with the sole reason of the expectation for a compounded return on earth is foolish, and it is not biblical. Do not look at giving as some kind of a barter system with God. It needs to be a heart exchange, not a stock exchange. If you give 10%, it does not mean that financially you're going to get 20 or 30 or 40 back on your investment. Material prosperity does not equal spiritual maturity. Give because it's his anyhow. And be amazed what happens with the other 90%. Give because you want to take that blessing, those treasures with you into heaven, not so you can get some kind of an advantage or breakdown here, in, in this part of life. You know, there's a popular phrase out there that's made its way into the Twitter world a while back. It's called YOLO. I don't know if anybody's ever seen this. It stands for you only live once, YOLO, Y-O-L-O. -O. Often teens or young adults will do something risky or wild, maybe even a little bit mischievous, and they'll describe it in a sentence or two, put maybe a picture up of it, and then on their Twitter site they'll put hashtag YOLO, right? So here's, here's a couple of the ones I saw when I just clicked on this. So, wanted to see if mom's minivan could do 100 miles an hour. It can. Hashtag YOLO. You only live once. I just mooned band practice at my old high school. Hashtag YOLO. Decided to drive to Fort Lauderdale for ice cream. I live in Dayton, Ohio. Hashtag YOLO. YOLO. You get it? So you get the premise or the concept of this? What if we were to take YOLO and apply it to this rope? What if, in this blue part, you were to take YOLO, you only live once, try to just give something amazing away that will be stored up for you in eternity? Hashtag YOLO when it comes to giving. You know, God puts it this way in Malachi 3. He says, you are cursed with a curse. Now listen to this strong language, folks. For you are robbing me, the whole nation of you, 
bring the full tithe, that's the 10%, into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and listen to this, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. Nowhere else in the Bible does God say, put me to the test. And I think his language in this section is so strong because he understands that the stronghold that money has on this. I just, I almost just sense God is pleading with us in no uncertain terms. Try me. Try me on this one. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Try me on this one. Can I just ask a question? Has this message maybe pushed you a little bit? You know, if you, you may maybe even stirred up a little bit of anger, or whatever that is in there. Maybe it was some shot on the video. Maybe it was something I said. Are, are you a little mad at me right now? Maybe you're saying, well, it's easy for you to say, Scott. I mean, you're a pastor. Tithing should be part of your job or something, right? Are, are you a little mad at the, at the church? Oh, all churches do is ask for money. I sounded like Pittsburgh dad there, right? I'll turn to his ass for money. Maybe you're a little mad at God. You know, God, if you would just cut me a break and give me more, I would give some back to you. Can I ask you just to check something? Is it anger? Or could it be fear? Maybe you're afraid that you're not going to have enough. Maybe it's fear that you're not going to have as much as the next guy or gal. Maybe it's fear that you're going to miss out on something. Maybe fear is really at the root of this area of my own worst enemy. And it's not me and it's not the church and it's not God. Here, just hear me on this. YOLO, my friend. You only live once. Test him. That's what that scripture says. I feel like he's almost daring us. Set aside your fears. Do what the Bible said. Test him with it. What do you think of this statement? I have to give. I love to give. I live to give. Let me land with this. You know, I think for me, I started with I have to give. It was an act of obedience 20-some plus years ago. I knew that spiritually it was foundational. And no matter how hard it was for me, it was I had to give. It was an act of obedience. But somewhere along the line, and I don't know when, it moved to I love to give. That 90% that I kept felt so free and so good that all of a sudden I was starting to find ways to give it away and bless other people that, that maybe were in need. And we were, we, we were and we are loving that. And I think for some of us, we get to this point where I, I live to give. And I have to admit, I, I don't know if I'm there yet. Th these are folks that make money so that they can give it away. Th they, they, they do things that are all about storing up treasures for, for heaven right? It, they, they realize it's not about the car or the big home. And again, there's nothing wrong with those things. But they get to the point where enough is enough. And they just realize, and I'm good. I'm good with what I've got. And now I want to make money so that I can give it away. I want to sponsor another child. I, I want to give more to this orphanage or this cause. I want to help the homeless. I want to make money so I can give more away. Man, that's a good place to be. I, I, I want to get there. And I think it starts with I have to give. And then you're going to develop this love for giving. And you're going to get to the spot where you live to give. I'm going to ask the campus leaders at our other campuses to jump up now and close out their, um, their gathering.